Welcome to the Dawn Jarvis Show. Today, we're going to be talking about changing the conversation about inclusion with Jan Peters. We're going to learn how that inclusion is important for engineering and can't be left to chance, that people need to learn to listen and notice more so that teams are stronger and happier and that people can learn to appreciate themselves and use this to manage their well-being. Jan Peters has been a senior policy advisor on women in STEM since 1999. She set up Catholic in 2004 and researches, writes and speaks about women and intersectionality. She also speaks about transforming engineering education to be inclusive. Jan has an MBE for her services to women and diversity in engineering. So welcome to the Dawn Java show, Jan. It's really good to see you. How are you doing? I'm really good, thank you. Absolutely thrilled to be here today. Oh, it's so good to see you. I'm really looking forward to your story and actually hearing more about you. Um, The first question I wanted to ask you was, how did you get to be where you are today? You know, you're a speaker, you're a teacher, you coach and mentor, you do lots of things. You've got an MBE. This is a magnificent life. that um, that you've had so how did you get to where you are today and how do we know each other we know each other from uh, a mastermind together don't we so you know that's the the power of networking but yeah so how did you get to be here today Jan? Well I know I think if I if I was if you asked me back when I was 14 years old what did I want to do I would (laughs) never have imagined that I was doing what I'm doing today and I'd been through the the cycle of wanting to be a brain surgeon an astronaut the prime minister and an optician randomly. And then I realized I didn't want to sit in a dark room on my own. And I think that is a realization is that, or not in a dark room on your own, but, but you know, in a small space where you're dealing with somebody one-on-one, it's the same kind of thing day after day. And I just realized that when I was 14, I just wanted to make a difference. And I just enjoyed science and engineering and technology. I loved, um, understanding how and why things did things but a really tiny level wasn't for me the big astronomy big picture of the world which is kind of interesting when I think what I do now which is very much about transformational change shifting mindsets moving people forwards and so so I would never have known that this existed as a as a role yeah. um, but what I do is I work for myself which gives me that sense of control over what I do my day can be as varied and chaotic as I want but I know that when I'm working on something and I'm really in a groove and particularly when I'm working with somebody on something that's really different really pushing the boundaries and changing thinking I am so focused you would think it was my number one talent theme um so Focus and patience is something that people wouldn't necessarily ascribe to me. But, you know, when you're in the groove and you're focused on, you're energised by what it is you're doing and you see that it can have an impact, that is what, uh, that's, that I am really in my, in my zone. So, so to get here, I thought I was going to be a science journalist when I was 18, but that was really about, I think I hadn't, been able to articulate what it is I wanted to do but it was this kind of translator between disciplines so I ended up doing chemistry and oceanography that that good old careers quiz you do when you're 17 Mm. and you've got no idea what you want to do and you put in your hobbies well water sports oh immediately it's going to look at something to do with the water um so yeah chemistry and oceanography was then I did electronic materials and then I did a PhD looking at solar cell design um, and you know, number went to work in industry after I've been doing my PhD. Then I um, got a job working in the public sector, which was helping commercialise science and technology. And then it was just through some random opportunity for a secondment, I ended up working on women in science and engineering. And I think I, I found a space where I could see that things could be done differently, and that people could change. Uh, we could, and I, that I could see a way to do things that I don't think other people had seen at the time. And so I set about working in this secondment opportunity in the government and 
um, ended up carving a bit of a niche for myself as an expert in understanding what we meant by inclusion, diversity and equity. And then through a number of other opportunities, um, I was working for myself what, since 2004 um, and phoned a friend because somebody wanted me to create a project around transforming engineering so it was inclusive and met this amazing guy who was the Dean of Engineering at University College London and uh, I had an amazing conversation with him one night and we created this programme so I ended up helping to design a new engineering programme that threaded inclusion not just into the way that uh, people behave with each other as, as students, colleagues, peers or educators but actually threading it into the fundamentals of what engineering is about, which is about problem solving for people. And it was like everything that I then believe came together into this. And as part of it, I was introduced to this Clifton Strengths tool around coaching. And we threaded that into the undergraduate program at UCL. And it just suddenly everything started fitting together into jigsaw pieces. Um, and that's pretty much how I am today. That's amazing. What an amazing story. There's so much there. I was thinking, and I was thinking when you started talking, when you said, oh, I was thinking about being a brain surgeon, you could have been a brain surgeon if you'd have wanted to be, you know, you could have done all of those things. You could have been a, a science journalist. You could have been all of those things, but you, you, you did this and you, you followed your passion and it, you followed your problem solving approach and, you know, and used that when, when you met people and around, you know, I really like what you said about engineers about solving problems and um, when I was preparing for this, I thought engineering and inclusion, that's not, not a sentence I've said out loud um, before. I nearly, I nearly actually recorded that. <laughs> but, you know, it's sort of like it doesn't necessarily come together naturally, but it is natural because it is very important. And engineering sort of like underpins so much that we that we do say, you know, it underpins everything. So it's really important. I know it's really important to you that engineers are educated and they really think about inclusion because of the products um, that they design, you know, are inclusive. They have to be, or so it also won't work, will they? And it's sort of, it's sort of a bit of a full circle for me. That, and actually, I thank you for that, for sort of like, you know, and I think people don't think about inclusion as pertaining to themselves but it does pertain to everybody. What do you think about that, Jan? I think, I think it's spot on. Inclusion for me is so fundamental and at the core of what engineering is about that it's just too important for it to be left a chance. And when I discovered there was not even a mention of or appreciation of diversity in, in the higher education system, let alone in colleges, um, I was a bit flummoxed to start with. And, and it, it wasn't immediately that that phrase, you know, inclusion is so fundamental to engineering, it's too important to be left to chance, came to me really when I was preparing to do a keynote somewhere. And, and it's, it is because it's around the way that students behave towards each other. And I believe is that in a, the education system, everybody has the the right to the same outcome, which is a really good quality educational experience. And for engineers, it's as important for, it doesn't matter where you come from as an engineer, you need to have a really the same opportunity to achieve your potential. Now, you may not have had that at the beginning of your life or your educational experience, but it's for each engineer to learn as part of their core skills they're called management and leadership expertise every individual student needs to have that realization that it's their learning is to mobilize motivate stimulate encourage and raise up each one of their colleagues whoever they may be however frustrating they may find them and I think one of the challenges we find in the education system is that most academic tutors really are at a loss about how to even go forward on that and therefore we still have in 2022 an awarding gap for um, for black students for students from uh, economic backgrounds that have limited their life choices and life chances mm -hmm. and so in engineering once someone's been through an engineering degree they're going to you know you, you might say that they're not they, they have the opportunity to get themselves a really good job and transform their lives but actually quite often people don't feel like they fit in, so they drift away. 
engineering needs every single engineer they can have. And it's, it's, it's core to the way that the subject is taught and the industry should be working. I really like what you're saying around that. And I like, I like, um, and I'm going to say, uh, <laughs> um, people that used to work with me in the management in the NHS will, will recognise this and wince, but it needs to be the golden thread that, that, that's throughout um, the, um, the whole curriculum and everything, isn't it, really? And I really, really like the way the philosophy um, that it's that of embedding it in the course in the you know because it's it's part of everyday life not that it's like a, a module on inclusion it's a it's it's a, it's about embedding it in the course and I think um I really recognize what you say that people do the do their degree do their profession I'm a nurse and you know you may you may so on the on the surface of it you may you know you've got a profession so you've got a, a guarantee almost of a good career However, there's a socialization around that. There's the, you know, the being part of society around that. And do you fit into those cultural norms? And I really like that you start with ed the education in the profession, the education around the discipline, around, you know, what the impact that you're making and, you know, and how you include people and how, and, you know, you're absolutely right. And it's not, it's not just engineering, as you know, there's lots of shortages in lots of things. Every profession needs all their professionals to work in it because you're spending so much money training them and educating them yeah. that to utilize their, their skills and their knowledge in their profession to the greater good. And I, you, you mentioned that you your nursing background, and I, I think there's some really interesting parallels between mm -hmm. engineering and nursing, mm -hmm. engineers and nurses. And, and if you think about it, you've got the kind of flip in terms of in nursing, it's predominantly female people, you know, women yeah. that are a profession. In engineering, it's it's a very masculinized um, discipline, and quite often the the women that go into it have, historically have adapted and adopted the kind of a more masculine tra uh, transactional way of, of being. Mm -hmm. But but fundamentally, they're both professions about people. Mm -hmm. You know, in engineering, we are around. Uh, solving problems for people whether it's a service or it's a solution to a problem whether it's in a high-tech uh, economy like in the UK or it's in an economy uh, that's um, I don't know somewhere there where there's a lot of farming going on but there how can we help improve their lives and one of the other challenges is about how where are we getting the raw materials for all the infrastructure for the technology we're creating mm -hmm. and what's the impact on the, those people lives mm -hmm. so they're both professions that are profoundly about people very different ways yes. but nobody w enters nursing to work on their own and I don't know of any engineers that work on their own they work with people all the time as users and as clients and customers and colleagues same yeah. in nursing so, so true, so true. The parallels are definitely there. And you talk also, you know, again, about people not working by themselves and, and you know, people work in teams, no man's an island or whatever, whatever project you're doing, whatever you're whatever you're doing and there's, there's lots of engineers that work in the health service so as you as you know and and you talk about that people need to listen to each other and notice each other so people can learn and interact um, um better so talk to me a little bit more about that Jan. yeah so you know we we when we go through all our management courses and leadership we talk about and even as students you know like we talk about listening skills active listening yeah and it struck me when um, that when we talk about active listening, people think about it as being like nodding your head, your body, body language, yeah. and being present in the moment. Um, and we, we also talk a little bit about asking questions, open questions, not closed questions. But we don't, we don't, when we're, or in my experience, most of the places I've been and, and encountered listening skills, it, it doesn't go beyond that. And I don't know about you, but when you find when you're having conversations with people, we, tell, we, we can very easily enter into a kind of echoing build relationship, rapport building process where we're, um, we're, we're listening. So if you were telling me a story about your friend, your partner who was ill or, or some trauma that had happened. And what I found in the past is you're busy thinking, almost playing top trumps oh, I know somebody <laughs> of that. And you end up 
having this kind of, oh, I know someone that I know someone who's broken my leg. Oh, mine at a spiral fracture. And anyway, so that's kind of like a flippant way of looking at it. But we if we're not careful, we're too busy thinking about what we're going to say next, rather than really trying to understand what you're telling me. And so I'm not I'm not thinking enough about being present in the right kind of way. And so there was a, a coach talked to me once and he has this approach of, and he calls it notice, listen, question. And it's it's also about going to that deeper level. And it's the sort of, um, you know, the, the body, the mind and, and the sort of language that you're using in terms of helping me to understand what it is that you're telling me. And so the, the technique that I use with, with students is to, um, start up getting them to ask questions and one of the tricks it's the um, so, um, Michael Bungay Stanya book which is um, ask more questions ask more listen and um, the, the title of the book and it's usually sitting on my side and it's <laughs> we'll basically about yeah. ask, ask better questions I can send yeah. you the link to put in the chat yeah. afterwards yes. and it's blue and yellow book and one of the great one of his seven questions is start with what um, so Michael you know Simon Sinek says start with why but Stan Bungay Stanio says start with what and if you ever try just starting questions with the what it's really interesting how it shifts the whole conversation but when you're someone's telling you a story if you say say to them what happened next okay so immediately you're interested in what happened next but also what were you feeling oh. And, and the person who's telling the story might pause and go, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, I was actually, I was a bit scared, I was a bit nervous, I was a bit worried. Mm. And what was the impact? What was the impact of that? And it's really interesting how it really shifts the conversation to one that you are actually genuinely interested in. But it also makes the, con the storytelling by the other person, rather than a very long rambling saga, it might in in require you to do a little bit of interrupting. <laughs> yeah. but occasionally it's okay to interrupt but yeah. it, it makes the other story being really interesting and and it and much richer and lessons can then be drawn out and learned so I think that learning to listen better and, and deeper um is a, something I love to try and practice and um and it's yeah and I try and as well to then encourage this group coaching um in my business I give people those sort of techniques and tools so that that helps them when they're practicing coaching in their breakout groups and so they're not just learning they're being coached they're actually learning how to be a better coach or a better manager and I think it's it's and um you know not everything's about inclusion or maybe everything is about inclusion but I think it helps in those discussions that you have um to if you can ask questions people think you're interested you know and you are interested because you're asking the question you know even by asking the question you're noting that you're 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 letting the, the person you're talking to know that you're interested in what they're good what to say and, and not just thinking about what what they what what am I going to say and that makes it a different conversation it makes it a more connected conversation and it makes it more of inclusive com conversation because it's not just um I'm telling you all about me I'm interested in I'm interested in you and I'm really interested not just in what what you say it's a bit like you know how are you and sort of like the great British thing and say fine you know <laughs> so what yeah. does fine mean you know, know. and my, uh, my line manager used to wander in did management by walkabout once and he he's, he's sort of was really proud of the fact that he took time most days to go and see people but he would say how are things going which is to me is the worst question in the world to ask anybody you know, because the only answer really is fine yeah. and not what do you want to achieve today what would yeah. make today good and successful from your perspective yeah much deeper question yeah so that questioning is really important and but the thing about listening and inclusion and, and like this my push to change the diversity and inclusion conversation is that people actually do want to be noticed and do want attention and by giving them that by listening to them you are giving them your time mm -hmm. and giving them the attention and then that is going to give you the the build trust between you 
and immediately will bring you closer together and it will lift up that other person because you'll be able to start understanding the challenges that they're facing on a day-to-day basis. And I, so I think having that conversation and developing those listening skills within our student populations is really vital to create um, a, a community of, I suppose it's a community of practices, it's really a way of being that lifts everybody up and it becomes immediately less competitive. And it also becomes something that the, when students then go to interview, they're able to say, I like to practice how I can have better conversations with people because I like to learn to listen. And one of the projects that I worked on at the beginning of this journey with UCL was we were, into, we were creating three scenarios for students to work on. And one of the uh, people we interviewed was the chief engineer for the highways agency. And she's, we asked her about leadership and she said, leaders always, what's the greatest skill and attribute? She said, leaders always listen. And I think great leaders always listen, but I'm not sure that leaders always listen. And I think that's a really <laughs> important differentiator. And yeah. Because again, it's about giving that attention. I think it's just a fairly small shift in behavior that we're, we're then asking people to make, which then opens up a whole new landscape of as manager, as coach, and manager as being interested in people. Um, and it just fits into that whole kind of qu- total quality environment where we're thinking about, you know, health, safety, well-being and, and the environment. And that by, by listening more, um, we are going to lift and be focused on well-being of individuals. And that is so important these days. Yeah, that's really, really good. And I, I, I really like, I like, I really, so one of my sayings is the greatest gift you can give anyone is your attention. And you've really sort of like, you know, fleshed that out a bit because it's, it's like, it's a signaling of interest. It's sort of like building rapport community. And also I like it. I like it as a, it's an actual skill and, and an actual thing that you can say, oh, um, you know, one of my skills is, um, is listening and how I can demonstrate it is by, by doing the method that you you suggested so you know that that is that is that is really good and really important and I I, I also like how you linked it to leadership and to and management and how you can how, how you can use that because I hear I hear what you're saying about you can you can listen and but be thinking about what you're going to say you can listen and not act on what's been said um but there's a skill isn't there about sort of like listening so what's that saying how's that person feeling you know how how you know how are they going to get the the objectives that you want them to do as your boss or as their leader to do and how are they feeling about it and how can you help as, as, as well so there's lots of um things you can get from from that information um so yeah, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. So you also, we you know this this podcast is about um, health and well-being, and I'll come talk about your health and well-being in a bit. But you also say that people um, need to value and appreciate themselves, and that will help their health and well-being. And I, and and it's a, there's a there is a movement, is there, about self-love and self-care? But I sort of wanted to get your take on it, Jan. I think you know, as a, as a strengths coach what the very the focus is around focusing on what you do right not on what you do wrong mm-hmm. it's referred to as positive psychology and and i'm certified in the clifton strengths tool and having a vocabulary and a language to talk about the things that are core to your being is really amazingly important but it allows you to then do self-reflection and notice when you're using your top talents and when you're in your strength zone and it means that when you're not feeling so good, you can then go back to your reports or to your to a previous reflection and think, what do I need to energize myself? What am I doing when I'm feeling really buzzed? Although I think some people use buzzed in a different, different kind of <laughs> way. But um, you know, I mean it, I mean it is then like a really excited, energized state, naturally, not not medica- medically induced. Yes. Um, and and I I think it's around, so when I, over the last year, I, I've been, I've kept myself sane by having, being involved in a number of different uh, global groups and, and a couple of different book masterminds where we read business books. Um, 
And one of them was based, was the Gallup have brought out this um, well-being at work book. And at the same time, I was involved in a local um, business mastermind group, peer learning network. And um, you each, we took it in turns each month to go and share a challenge that we were facing in our business. And there are people from all sorts of different kinds of businesses there. And at one of them, there was a guy who was really quite an organized structure guy. And he said, and I gave an overview of what I do, my business, my my community contribution, which is creating a science center, but supporting the local residents network too. And, and he just, he sat there and he said, do you not think you're doing too much? And I went, oh, so I left the meeting and I came, drove home and I was thinking, wow. Anyway, that night we were doing, I was doing the well-being at work book with loads of Clifton Strengths coaches. And, um, and one of them in the breakout, a breakout room said, yeah, Jen, you're, when do you find time for you? So I went, oh, so that's two people in one day have said, are you doing too much? So as part of the book group, um, we were creating a grid of all our Clifton Strengths and the five areas of the Gallup well-being framework, which is um, can I remember them? Um, and one, well, one of them is about is social, um, physical, um, social, physical health, um, and why can't I remember them? I know them so well. Anyway, <laughs> and uh, I'm they, oh, financial and okay, not, cool. not family. Anyway, so anyway, one of the ones I looked through my profile and it was. Basically, I get energized by doing things and being busy, but helping to connect and energize other people. And and it even all in, in, in the book, what's so useful about it is that he said, if you're a person who's got activator and likes to work in a group and energize other people, it said, find yourself a social community project to get involved in. I was like, oh, tick. Um, and then it said under the physical one, it said, so you like to um, um, interact because of your profile in with other people so rather than trying to beat yourself up by having a, a detailed schedule of doing things on your own find a community group to connect with and and, and organize it and energize yourself by by and energizing other people and I thought oh so I play in a uh, mum's uh, community rugby team where we raise money for a mental health charity um, uh, which is Papyrus and Red Lipstick Foundation, which supports teens with mental health challenges. So we, we've all, over the last four years, rather than standing on the sidelines, and we meet on a Monday night and we, in the freezing cold, and we throw a rugby ball around and we're becoming, I wouldn't say competent, but we, we have an absolute blast. We've got a great community of sisterhood. We support each other um, and um uh, it's it's an amazing space to both get fit stay fit and connect with each other and so uh, rather than me that's sitting down and saying I won't do that I won't do this mm -hmm. I'm energized by trying to bring science and engineering into my community and creating a science center and there are times when I I roll my eyes at myself and I don't want to go to another meeting but the next thing someone says is could we could we write a, f a funding proposal on on this and who's straight there and I love doing it. So I'm energized by making a difference. When somebody says to me, Dan, just sit down, chill, have a glass of wine. I, it's not me. So I think <laughs> knowing, knowing who you are and where you get your energy from is really important. I know that for me, I'm, I've got, I'm, I'm quite a cerebral thinker. So actually, if I need to go for a walk on my own, um, and I do try now to build back in the commuting time that I've lost, which means going out with some podcast in or actually going to making myself go and visit somebody who lives an hour's drive away so that I've got an hour to just let my brain mull around in the car. I love that. I don't think many of us, those of us who haven't perhaps realised that we do need space to think, not space to just relax, but actually space to just let our brains chund around. That it's we've we're, I, we're, those of us who enjoyed commuting for whether we could read we could chat we could sleep we've lost that and so I've only recently rediscovered that was how important that was for me um so yeah I I've realized that I don't need I need to manage my energy by being busy because that's what energizes me I love that I love that Dan and I really really love um 
what you said about building back in the community in time, because um, I was talking to my son last night about this, about where uh, I said, there's too much stuff that I could read, I could, I could watch, and um, I haven't got time to do it. And, uh, and I have said, that for, for during this pandemic, and all this time I've been having my business and working at home, I said, I used to listen to things when I was either driving to meetings from my work, or I was commuting on the tube. And I haven't got that anymore. And you've come up with a solution. The solution <laughs> is to build that time up, even, even if it's to go for a walk during that time that you would have, you know, the hour, half an hour that you would have taken to to go, that I would have taken to go into town, into work, into Waterloo. Um, that sort of like, that was the time I listened to podcasts. That's the time I listened to music. And sometimes I did nothing. I just thought, I just was alone with my thoughts because there was no other time that I could just sit by myself. So I used that commuting time. So I think that, and you're right, it's so valuable. We've lost it. Yeah. So, you know, I literally get out of bed, have my breakfast and start working. And, you know, and, don't, and I don't have that, that time to think or plan the day or what I'm going to do. Um, or even to scroll through social media that I used to do when I was on doing my commute. So yeah. it's really important to sort of like put that time back in. I it really, is. really, really like that. And um, and I also like that you you just to look at your strengths. You know what energizes you, what 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 motivates you, what makes you happy. To look at the things around how you're going to do your health and well being. You know, so um, I come from a rugby family, so loving the fact that you're part of a you know a female rugby uh, rugby group and that you get a lot of joy out of that. But it doesn't have to be that. It just it has to be something that gets you energy and you know what you know whatever you're doing. So you know I get energy I don't know from podcasts, but was really struggling. To to find the time but it's sort of like what you know how and how can you build that into your day so that is that is fantastic Jan and um, I uh we also because I I asked so we talked about the Clifton strengths and we talked about another book that I can't remember off the top of my head but I will for the for the um for the show notes and then um, I also asked you sort of like to uh, what is your favorite book and you chose a book um that isn't um, I don't think it is a I don't think it's a self-help book or a learning book the uh, the gentleman in Moscow oh yeah yeah and that's if you I do I do commend people to to read it um because it's beautifully written really phenomenal writing but it's a beautiful story too and I started reading it as part of a book group that I'm in and um a face to face book group normally and we and it was we started reading it in i think for march 2020 which was right at the beginning of lockdown and the the character is confined to a very nice hotel in moscow for crimes against the, the state but he's rather than uh, not into a nice room which is where he would have stayed in that hotel but into the attic where there's all sorts of bits of junk and there's connected rooms and there's a room with a door that he finds that nobody else knew and it's the story of how he is incredibly resourceful and builds and makes the best of his life and it really struck with me and this isn't why I liked it but it just struck a chord with me as I was at the beginning of lockdown when we were realizing that we are confined pretty much to the boundary of our property however big or small that might have been um, but that same feeling as he's trudging up the stairs but also the realisation it doesn't have to be like that. But it's just this the fact that it's such a great story and it's written so well. And there's a few kind of cameos of characters that just come in and out of the book. And one of them is a, a small girl in a bright yellow dress in this his drab life. But the fact that she was in a yellow dress, I, was, I loved. And she came into his life and really pushed him out of his comfort zone. She was probably about 10 or 11 at the time. So I love it on many different levels. And also it's, whilst I love the ending um it ties things up but actually not in a sugary sweet kind of way so I love that I do have another one that I didn't recommend which was Atlas Shrugged I don't know if you've read that by Ayn Rand no, I eight, it's like 800 pages long uh -huh. and it's, but I just I I didn't realize it was written in the 1950s until I'd finished it and looked at the front of the cover uh, I thought it was written in the sort of 90s or noughties but yeah no, I do yeah read absolutely everybody should read The Gentleman in Moscow that's fantastic so 
I know that you do lots of things. I know you do contracting. I know you do consultancy. You speak, um, and you also have, um, you know, a community groups that you that you run yourself and that inspire people through. How can people? So, first of all, is there anything that you'd like to share with the audience, and so they can work with you? And then, um, how can people get hold of you? Yeah. No. Great. Thank you. Um, so I. I run a, an engineering community group, which a free one called Live Lounge. We meet every month and that's for people generally interested in how to embed inclusion into engineering education, whether it's further or higher education. And, and then if people are interested in the Clifton Strengths, we do a free Strengths Jam every month as well. Um, but we also have a coaching group called Momentum Coaching. Um, we run it monthly for those who wish to join monthly. But we also have a, uh, a three month coaching group, which is open at the moment and um, closes next week. And that is a, a group coaching for small groups of 12 people who join us um, for uh, six coaching sessions for an hour every two weeks um, using the Clifton Strengths tools. So people are learning some coaching strategies and practicing those, but they're also being able to focus on their own internal goals, bring challenges. And the one thing I really, really love about group coaching is you've got a hive mind of solutions that people can offer. And but you also hear other people's challenges, which even if that's not a challenge that you've brought into the group, it allows you to think, oh, that's interesting. So when you come across something in the past, you've either got a connection in your new network to go to for insights um, and to explore whether it might work, for, a solution might work for them, or you've just got an extra bit of enriched your experience and knowledge. Um, and you learn about 12 other people at the same time who are have got very different and diverse backgrounds and different strengths profiles. So how do you get in touch with us? Well, we're on catalytic.co.uk, which is K-A-T-A-L-Y-T-I-K. Um, we come up pretty high in search engines if you do catalytic Jan Peters. But we've also got um, LinkedIn. We're on Facebook and Instagram. And we're on Linktree as Catalytic Limited. Brilliant. And then um, all those notes um, will be in the in the show notes um, wherever you're listening or or watching um, watching this. So this has been fantastic. Thank you so much, Jan. And I really like your different perspective on on inclusion, you know, on diversity, on equity. I really like what you talked about about listening and how people can use that and how people can learn from others um, as well. Um, is there a message um, that you would like to share with the audience as we as we um, uh, before we go? You know, I think, I think some people might wonder why listening is something that I think is so important equal equity diversity and inclusion and I think it's because so so long there's so many people that haven't been heard and it's not that they haven't been talking about the challenge it's just that people have I don't know if chosen not to hear them is the right phrase but they've been focused on something else so they've been deaf to them and so we need to listen both but we need to notice when people are contributing or talking we need to not think people are whinging or complaining, or if you're in a minoritized group in a, in a company or a, an education sitting, minority group chatting, they're not plotting anything. They're just having a bit of me time. Um, but equally, we need to be able to listen so we can change things to improve where we work and ultimately work towards creating a place where people can be happier. Pretty simple, really. Very simple and I love it. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Um, that's it for the Dawn Java show today. Um, if you like what you heard, please um, like, listen, subscribe and share. And I'll see you soon. Take care.